Yeah, this is a, so in this example, we were making this, the image smaller. Now we will make it larger. So this is the nearest neighbor uh, uh, enlarging. This is the bilinear enlarging, and this is the big cubic enlarging. And for instance, we can look at some high frequency path uh, uh, detail. So like, for instance, this, this flag here. And the flag is, is much better in the bilinear than in the nearest neighbor, and in the big cubic than in the bilinear. How you interpolate it is uh, very important. Any question? No? Okay, so we have seen uh, or we have introduced uh, interpolation in the context of making images uh, larger or smaller. Um, we will now uh, use, now that we know how to interpolate, we will use it to, to apply geometrical transformations to images. So in general, so let's say that uh, if you have this input image, and then this input image, you see that uh, the, the walls of the, of the house, because of the perspective, that they are not straight. So we want to make the walls straight. Uh, and then we will deform the space to have the, the walls at the end. Straight. Somehow, this uh, space deformation, I, I like this figure here. Um, I like this image here. So you see, you are going from a, a space where it, it is deformed, and then you undeform it to have it straight. Okay, so we are deforming the space, but now in an arbitrary way. It is not only like resizing. Resizing is just taking the space and making it larger or smaller. So it is kind of not the kind. It is an affine transformation. So you simply you stretch the the, the, the space, and now you stretch the space differently at different locations. Okay, so that is what we will do. Um, and that is also applicable to rotations, for instance. So when you uh, rotate an image, what you're doing is deforming the space by rotating it. And in general, this uh, space deformation it is called the warping function. Um, and then the warping function will tell you every point in the output <coughs> where it is coming from in the input. <coughs> and in general, that point from the input will not be at one of the sampling points, so it will have to interpolate. Uh, but we already know how to interpolate, so uh, now you take the value from that point and, and you put it in the output. Okay, so this is a description, and I think it is better seen by an example, so yeah. So let's go to here. So I think it is better seen with some drawing. So we have an input image I. We have an output image A. We have I. And how do you call them? I J C P. And these locations here, so RJCJ will be a point, will be a point, so there will be some function phi and RJCJ. Okay, so that, that is any point in here. This is the RJCJ point. It's transformed into, into a point RICI. RICI. That in general refraction. Okay, so this is a two dimensional function. 
these bad eyes that I okay, And if you want, you can expand that in, and decompose it into functions. So you can decompose it as phi of i r j c a phi of c r j c a so this is r i and this is c i so you have two components so this will give you a vector and this will give you a scalar and yeah, so these functions here, these functions here, yeah, on the working function. And in general, these two values will be fractional, so that you will have to interpret. So to evaluate this thing, you will have to interpolate. You will have to interpolate image times at this location. But we already know how to interpret. Okay, so let's concentrate now on the working function. So now this lecture is about the working. We don't have to introduce any more the interpolation. Okay, so let's say that we have this image. This will be our input image i, and we want to make the towers straight. So we want to have that, okay, so that the towers are straight. So for doing that, what we will do is to make it a set of points. So in this example, we are taking six points. And if you look, for instance, at this tower, so you see that the bottom of the tower, it has a coordinate that is 52 something. We don't care about the something, the something is the height. And, and this one has 80 something. So we would like, if it is a straight tower, this 52 and the 80 should be the same body. And that is what makes it a straight. And the same here. So it goes 403, 412, 913, 872. So we want to produce a set of points. You see, we want to take, sorry, we want to take this 80 something into, sorry, what is it? in the wrong direction. I want to make it from 80 something to 52 so that it, it is a straight. Okay, so then, and then after applying the, the, the transformation function, I want to have this thing. Okay, so let's see. I will construct, I will construct transformations that are of this form. So, I want to construct transformations. Uh, so, this working function that is very general, I want it to be, uh, in general, we can call this, uh, we can call this the vector rj, the coordinate the j. So, I want to construct functions. That are this form. So the interpolation scheme for, for making it simple, we will use Nader Snare just to keep it simple. And I want to construct uh, transformations that are this form. So I will take the input value, the input coordinate, multiply by by matrix, and then that will give me the new coordinate. Okay, so going in this direction. Going in this direction, I'm using the matrix. So going in this direction, I'm using the matrix minus one. Going in this direction, I'm using the matrix eight. So if I want to, if you give me, so let us write this equation here. So what we have in that equation is that R i is h minus one so if you give me a coordinate in J, I multiply by this matrix and then automatically I have the coordinate in O. I can solve for I. I can solve for RK, so, so I can say RT is H R I 
So if you give me a coordinate in, in the I image, I multiply by the matrix A, and then I have the coordinate at empty, at J. So if you go in this direction, you use H minus 1. If you go in this direction, you go, you, you use the matrix H. Okay, so uh, in the in the slide, we are, we are following that that uh, uh, convention. So from J to I, we use H minus one. Uh, and yeah, so the, the question is, what is this H? Okay, so let's let's go to our problem. So you know. We have a set of points. These are, are I coordinates. Okay, these are in the image I. So this is in the input. These coordinates here, these coordinates here are in the J image. This is what I want to produce. Okay, so I have a, a collection of, of steps. So I have uh, here they have coordinates x1, y1, but this is the first coordinate in the in the image i, and this is the first coordinate, the corresponding coordinate in the image j. So I have the first coordinate in, in i, first in j, second in i, second in j, p coordinate, p coordinate in, in i, p coordinate in j. And then I have a matrix that in general will have this form, because it has to transform two times two, uh, two times one vectors into time, two times one vector, so it needs to be two times two. So let us let us put this in the in the whiteboard. Okay, so it must be I will use R, I, and RJ. I think it is more clear the notation. Okay, so I have R. I one and this multiplied by H will be R J one H R I two that will be uh, R J two and I have all of those till the fifth coordinate I mean for the fifth coordinate uh, sorry. This is I, this is P. It will be R, J, P. Okay, but I, I can write this as a, as a, so this is an equation system, and, and H has to fulfill all those constraints. So, I ask one question. What is the minimum number of equations of this kind that we need? So let's think of this. How many unknowns do we have? How many unknowns? But these are the unknown. The unknown is H. And if A is of size 2 times 2, <coughs> we have four unknowns. And how many equations? Each one of these equations, this is a vector equation. So how many uh, equations, world equations? Are we having? For every one of these constraints, we have two equations: one for the rows, another one for the columns. So with just two, we are able to determine uniquely age. But uh, you already know this thing of, of uh, uh, least squares. So you can uh, we use it in, in uh, when transforming columns. So you can give me many pairs, and then I will try to find the age that more or less satisfies all of those. Okay, so let's do that. So what we will do is that uh, I can summarize all that into a uh, matrix. So I can say R I1, R I2, R I D. And this has to be equal to the matrix formed by these vectors. Rj1, Rj2, Rjp. Okay, so I have a matrix I, I, so I have a matrix 
tocar a esta matrix aquí, a J, sobre And then my equation system is of this form. So it is A times RI must be equal to RJ. Let's think of the sizes of these things. Okay, so this is 2 times B. This one is 2 times B. This is 2 times B. So uh, size wise, it is, it is correct. So it is a correct equation. But then I see Ri is not invertible because it is not a square matrix. So I cannot simply take Ri minus 1 to the, to the right, but we already know the solution of this. So we already know that I have to multiply by Ri transpose. Let's think of the sizes again. So this is 2 times 2, this is 2 times p, this is p times 2, this is 2 times p, this is 2 p times 2. So uh, now this product here is 2 times 2, and this one, this one also. So now I can invert this one. So I can say a is is a j r i t times r i r i transpose minus one. And, and this is two times two, this is two times two, and the whole product is two times two, that is what we want. So this is two times two, that is what we want. So we know that this is the the least square solution, least square solution of this equation system here. Okay, so then that is what, what we will do now. Okay, so here is the same equation system that we have. So we have H times Ri is equal to J. The notation is different. I think mine is a little bit better. And, and then we have this solution that is the same that we have. Okay, so now you are very happy. Now you know how to transform that and, and you can have numbers at, at the end. So you can see, uh, okay, so th those were my points. Those were my points in, in the RJ image. These are my points in the RI image. Uh, and then, this is, sorry, this is RI, this is RJ. And then you do all the calculations, and at the end you have this age. Okay, so what, what is the age? So, basically, let, let's forget about this value here. This is the one that is making it. Uh, a bit more straight, but there is an interesting thing that is uh, this. Okay, let's multiply. Let's forget for a moment about this number because it is relatively small. So let's forget about it. So what we are saying is that h minus one. So you take a point, Rj, that has Rj, let's call it x, Rj, y. You multiply by this matrix that was 0 0.97. Let's say that this is almost 0, 0 1. And this will be Ri. So it will be Ri at point x, Ri at point y. Okay, so now you do the multiplication, but this multiplication is very easy. So this is 0.97 rjx and then rjy. So what we are saying is this point stays the same. And that makes sense because our tower. So 
But when we go from here to there, the height of the tower, this is the direction y. So the height of the tower stays the same. And that is what this equation is saying. It says that the height of the tower stays the same. And what about this one? This one is saying in X, there is a small compression. Not too much, just a small one. That, that is uh, what it should happen. You see this point? This point should be compressed a bit to be straight. So instead of 80 that we had before, we, will, we want it to be a little bit smaller, 52. So there, there should be a small compression. So in Y there is no compression, in X there is a, a little bit compression. And so it makes sense having this matrix, but it happens that it is not enough. So this is the, the, the original image. And then when we apply the transformation, we see that it moves a little bit, sorry, it moves a little bit in the right direction, but it, it is not enough. So let's, for instance, here, this is what we had in the beginning. So this is what we had. And we wanted this frame. Yeah. It is even worse. In this, for this tower, it is more or less fine. For the middle tower, it is a, uh, it is good. So you see the middle tower. The middle tower was a little bit to the right after the transformation. Sorry, the transformation goes to the right place. But it is not exactly what we wanted. So we partially succeeded. Okay, so what is the problem? The problem is that we haven't used we haven't used a, a rotation a, a rotation no, a working function that is good enough. Going to the good enough uh, working function. Uh, all transformations. Have you studied singular value decomposition? Do you know that? Singular value decomposition, no? Eigen decomposition, you know. So Eigen decomposition. Eigen decomposition of a matrix. So let's say that you have your matrix H. So you have your matrix H. Uh, you can always uh, decompose it. Well, not always, but most often you, you can decompose it. There are some constraints to this, to this decomposition. But you can decompose it in this way, where this is a, a matrix, and this is a, a diagonal matrix that is made of that one. Let's say that this has a And uh, this is a matrix, let's say, gender. This is n times n. So you will have n uh, eigenvalues. Uh, and these eigenvalues, and this matrix P, this matrix P is made of some vectors u1, u2, un. And there is a constraint for this decomposition. That is, if you say h multiplied by one of these eigenvectors, you would have lambda one to one. So these are vectors that, after multiplying by matrix, they keep the same direction. They say they keep the direction only that with a different scale. So they are amplified or, or decreased by a different pattern. Okay, so this is the eigen. The composition, this one is I. There's another one. I can always decompose this one also in some other way. So I can decompose it as let me use the same notation as it's using USP transpose. 
no es un archivos. Uh, uh, there is a constraint now for this decomposition. So these singular values, they don't fulfill this equation here. So these are eigenvalues. These are these ones here. They are eigenvalues. These are singular values. So it is also a diagonal matrix. No relation so they are diagonal. So so it is there. Let, let's put there's a, a difference between this two. That is, this one now can be generalized to uh, arbitrary matrices of any size. The even the composition is only for square matrices. While this one is for matrices of any size. So this matrix here is of size n times n. This is of size n times n. And this is of size n times n. And, and these values here, these values here in the diagonal, I call this, I call the singular value, the singular values, singular values, and they are eigenvalues of the matrix H transpose H. There are even values of the matrix. And there is another constraint that is these U and V matrices are unitary. So U and V are unitary. And unitary means unitary means that U transpose u is equal to u transpose u and the same for v v transpose v v v transpose is equal to so they are the identity matrices let's think of a matrix let's put the example you know the 3d rotation matrix like, well, this this matrix i'm showing you you know cosine Theta times sine sine of theta sine of theta cosine of theta. Do you know that matrix? Yeah. It is the one that makes a rotation by by an angle theta. Let's call this matrix R. It is the rotation of theta. It is the rotation by an angle theta. If you multiply by R theta transpose, what do you get? Like the notion. You get it? So, unitary matrices are rotation matrices in some arbitrary uh, high dimensional space. So, if you have a unitary matrix, it is a rotation. And what do we have in the singular value decomposition? So in the singular value decomposition, we have a rotation, then a scaling, then another rotation. So that means any matrix transformation, any one, doesn't matter which one. We are using this one as an example. But any uh, matrix transformation, can be understood as a rotation, that is a rotation counter, counter uh, clockwise. This is clockwise by 19 degrees, then a scaling by a small factor, so 3% in X, almost 0.4% in Y, and then another rotation. But now this is counter clockwise. So, our transformation that we had before, we can understand it in this way. So first you rotate, then you scale, and then you rotate back. Any matrix transformation, this is surprising. 
So all transformations can be understood in this way. First you scale, then you scale, and then uh, and then you rotate back. Anyone. Okay, so but uh, as we said, we were not happy with this transformation. So we will do a different one now. Okay, so let's make a break. Okay, so what is wrong with this transformation? So this transformation is a 2D transformation. So we are taking 2D coordinates and transforming them into 2D coordinates. But uh, the problem with these towers was perspective. So perspective is a 3D, uh, is a 3D concept. So we need a third dimension. And, and for this third dimension, what we will use is something that are called homogeneous coordinates. Okay, so let's see what those homogeneous coordinates are. <coughs> so let's say that you have an image. And they have a point here, x, y. So that is the point x, y, good. And we will be presenting with many different data points. So we will represent it with kx, ky, k. Okay, so and given any point of this type, so let, let us call this point R, we will, we will call this point R tilde. So the tilde means that it is in homogeneous point. So homogeneous coordinates means we have added a third coordinate. Like this is arbitrary. Actually, all these points, all these points, they correspond to the point. Uh, so given an homogeneous coordinate, so it corresponds to the point x, y. Right? And in general, if you have the coordinate x in the Y till the um, Z till the, uh, I will not call it Z because I think it is confusing. K till the, this corresponds to the point X till the divided by K, Y till the divided by K. Okay, so it is simply another point, uh, another way of expressing points. So I have a unique point X, Y. But now, instead of expressing it as x, y, I will multiply them by a factor k, and then I will annotate in the third coordinate what is the factor that I have used. So, yeah, in general, uh, the most common homogeneous coordinate that we have is, is this one. So the most typical is by making the factor 1. So you say x, y, 1. Okay, so this is. This point x y corresponds to that, so that will be the homogeneous coordinate of, of that x y point. But the transformation is more general. So, given any point of this kind, uh, we will represent it with any arbitrary factor k. Okay, good. So then, now our these are we will represent. So we were using we we have this problem. Okay, we have this problem where we have an image I with a coordinate here. We have an image J, an image J with a coordinate here. J. And then if we wanted to go from one to the other. We have to multiply by h, and if we were in the other direction, we have to multiply by h minus. But now, now my coordinates will be homogeneous. Okay, so then uh, let's write this equation in homogeneous coordinates. So what we are saying is r r j. Homogeneous, but in general, 
use the same letter as the case using. So he is using U, V, and K. So we have K, I, V, I, K, I, V, I, K, I. So he is using the letters U, I, V, I. Here. I will put the I up. I will change the notation a bit. So this is for the, not because it is an image I, but because it is the point I. So we have point one, two, three, up to B. So this I is one, two, three, up to B. While this I here was because it is an image I. Okay, so yeah, I will do the same. I think it's a bit more clear this notation. So let me do it. K I U I K I V I and this is K I. So it is because it is the I point, not because it is in the in the I in the I image, the image I. Okay, so then this one. Is equal, but this is a three times one vector. So now it is equal to A times is coordinating in HI, and that coordinate is XI, YI. So I will use the same notation as this one. YI and one. And again, this is a three times one vector. This is a three times one. So this matrix now is three times three. And I have much more freedom than before. So before, we only had two values to figure with. So that I, I could only take and tune, fine tune four values. Now I have nine values to, to, to tune. So I can construct richer transformations. You see? But now, solving that. Uh, Solving for H is not as simple as we had before. Okay, because the problem is that we don't know these KI values. So we have to find some clever way of getting rid of the KIs and, and then uh, solve for H. Okay, so let's do that. So that is what we will do in the next slides. So we will do the same as before. So we collect all the input points in one matrix. Uh, all the output points in another matrix, and you see that the KIs can be different for each one of the, the points. And in general, any pair of points, so the first point in the in the image I and the first point in the image A, so they must be related by this matrix H. Okay, so you take the point in I, multiply by H, and then you take, you get the point in J. Good. And our announce, announce at the age and the KI. The KI we, we don't know either. Okay. So let us multiply all this. We multiply all that. And we have this equation system. And now we do the following. You saw uh, so you make arbitrarily you choose H33 to be one. Okay. Uh, it doesn't matter. We will divide it at the end. You could do like that, but uh, let's follow the reasoning in the, in the slide. Okay, so first you solve for uh, you divide the first and second equation, the first and third equation. You divide this one by the third one. Okay, so what do we have? So we would have ui, and then this is the numerator, and this is the denominator. Okay. And we have h33 that is uh, should be should stay there here it is. Okay. Then we divide second and third, and then we get this one. Okay, so now. Uh, we divide the numerator and the denominator by 
h is three three. Okay, so you divide up and down by h three three, and you get the same. So h three three will become one, and all the others you would have h one one divided by h three three, h one two divided by h three three. But you don't know what h one one is and what h one two is, so you can call that those with here. So you would have h one one divided by h three three. And then you can call this one h one one prime. Okay. And the same for all the others. But actually the name we didn't know h one one. So we don't care if it is called h one one or h one one prime. So we can use the same letter for both. So we relabel these coefficients. So we remove the primes. So they are not exactly the same h11 that we had at the beginning because we have divided by h3 but otherwise uh, the structure is the same so and, and they are announced that we have to move for so okay so now we have for every point points so we have a, an input point in mhi the corresponding point in mj and each one of the points is giving us two equations that is what it should. That is, uh, if I have a pair of points in 2D, I should have a pair of constraints. I have there my pair of constraints. And we can rewrite these <coughs> as these two equations. Okay, so it is simply taking the denominator to the other side. Now you rearrange and put everything on the left. Okay. Now we have everything on the left. And remind, what are our nouns? So our nouns are the age. That is what we don't know. All the other points we know. This, this U, V, and X and Y are the coordinates of the tower that we want to put straight. So if we rewrite this now in this way, so we gather all the unknowns into a single vector, this one. Even for convenience, we can put there one. So this one, actually, this is the independent term. And so what we have are the unknowns, and then these are the coefficients going with the ages. This is simply just multiply these by this age, and you find which are the coefficients. Okay, so every pair of points give us two lines of this kind, but we don't have just one pair of points, we have many. Okay, so we put the many constraints, so these are all the pairs of points that we want to keep uh, of our towers. And then what is the equation? Now the equation is A times H equals zero because on the other side we have zero. On this side we have zero all the time. Zero vector. Okay, so it has as many zeros as equations you have. Okay, then uh, you solve for that. And um, one uh, way to, to solve for that is uh, use singular value of the composition. You have not seen it. So I will not exploit it here. But at the end, uh, you can imagine that you can solve for, uh, for this equation system. So it is simply an equation system. You find the best way of solving it. That he's using singular value decomposition, but you don't know it. But now at the end, you will have uh, you will have some some age. Okay. So you will be able to solve. You will be able to solve that equation system. And um, I asked, we, we are not getting into this detail, but uh, you don't know why. But the solution of this equation system with singular value decomposition would be you compute the singular value matrix, you take this the smallest singular value, and the singular value, uh, the, the smallest singular value will have an associated vector VK. So here in this, uh, you remember the eigenvector decomposition. So every 
eigen uh, value had an associated eigen vector. So here it is the same. Every single value has a v vector associated to it. So now the solution for h is the is the vector k associated to the smallest singular value. But we don't care. So at the end you will have a, an h, and this h is the one that you can use to transform points. And once you have that, so for instance, what is it? Yeah, so once you have that, so you take a point, take a point in, in the image A, multiply by H minus 1. Remember that it has to be in, in homogeneous coordinates. So now you will have this result in general, and but all these points, uh, so but this, this vector, homogeneous coordinate, it is representing this, this point. It is representing, you keep X and Y the same and divide by the third one. That is what we were doing in, in homogeneous coordinates. So in homogeneous coordinates, so we have it. So whenever I have three components, my 2D point is x divided by k, y divided by k. So that is what we are doing. So I'm keeping x and y the same and dividing by the third one. And that is the point that I want to interpret. Okay, so now you have the whole procedure. So you take the coordinate in the output, multiply by h minus 1 to take it to the input, and you do the nearest neighbor interpolation, and uh, so you approximate to, to the nearest neighbor value coordinate, and then you interpolate the image at that point. And uh, yeah, this is the same. Uh, Procedure, but now described with words. Uh, I don't know. Um, it's not shown, but the result is, is much better. We don't have the, the picture showing the, the result of this uh, homogeneous coordinates, but it is much better than this 2D transformation. Okay, then, uh, what next? So, we can use these to rotate images too. Okay, so let's say that you have an image, an input image, we want to rotate it. Okay, so you want to produce the rotated image. And, and then comes several uh, considerations. So let us see. Let us do it here outside. So let's say that I have an input image I. So my input image I. So my transformation will be a rotation. And we already know how to rotate. Um, so let's say that this will be my rotated image. So let's say that this is size n minus n. So here on the this rotated axis, they also measure n times n. And this will be my image. And yeah, so now it comes the following the following considerations. That is okay, so n times n if it is at scale before going into that. What is a transformation? The transformation is one of these that we know. That is, for instance, the coordinate in J is, uh, let's rotate this way. So it would be cosine theta, sine theta, minus sine theta, cosine theta, uh, and coordinate in I. So you take any coordinate in I, rotate it, and now that, is, that gives you your coordinate in J. And if you want to go the other direction, you want to solve for R I or B, this is R theta, you have to do R theta minus 1 R J. But R theta minus 1, because it is a unitary. Uh, matrix that we saw before is cosine theta 
minus sin theta. Sin theta cosine theta. And then R T. If this is rotating in one direction, this is rotating in the other direction. Okay, but then if this is n times n in, in this kind of diagonals, overall it has to be Latin. So this n prime, n prime will be larger than n. Do you agree with that? So if you take something that is a straight and you rotate it, the output is like that. Do you agree? Yeah. Okay, so what happens with, uh, first, what happens with the borders? So what happens with, with these areas? I don't have information to fill those areas. So typically, you can do several things. Uh, one thing is to put it to zero. Another thing is to put it at the average of i. That is also fine. There is another possibility that is why don't we do something like in the Fourier transform? So in the Fourier transform, I am repeating this image many times and making it periodic. I could make it periodic too here. I could make it periodic and copy whatever I need from the period from the other periods. So this is another possibility. Making periodic periodic I okay and there are many possibilities. This is one consideration. The other consideration is okay it is a little bit inconvenient that if I enter with an image of size n then my output is also size is is larger than n. So why don't I keep simply the central part? Why don't I keep simply the part that is common? Okay, so I will keep the part, the central part of size n times n. And now my input and my output are of the same sizes. Okay, so that is uh, the, what these drawings are trying to do. Okay, so yeah, so we have this image that uh, we have a given number of rows, given number of columns, and we can we can derive some uh, some other measurements. Like, for instance, if this is number of rows, number of columns, what is the size of this diagonal? What is the angle associated to this R I C I? So this theta here. Okay, and. Um, and then I will rotate. I will rotate by an angle theta. And, and then here you already start to see uh, these drawings I was making. So let's say that I want to keep an image that is of size. Make a copy of that. I want to go to. Oh no, I, I can take it here. So, if you know, uh, um, I will keep something like this. If I would, let's, uh, let's say that I want to keep this central part of size n. So that central part of size n is this one. This the same size as I am. 
So there are some regions that are empty. This region, I don't know how to, how to fit. And this region, I don't know how to fit. And this is a region like that. And this region. So depending on the angle, the size of those uh, regions change. And let's say that we fill them with zeros. We are happy with zeros there. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, something else. So let's look at this equation here. So this equation here looks complicated. So it looks a little bit different from the one that we have in the, the whiteboard. So we have the rotation matrix that it has called P theta. But otherwise, we have things that are not the same. Okay, so let's uh, let's reason about those. Okay, so for us the rotation was something like this. So it was you take a, a coordinate in the input, multiply by by the matrix, and then you have your coordinate in the output. But we want to rotate with respect to which point? So I have an image array. And normally we are rules about the coordinates, but if we have an image of size n times n, depends on how you number things, but the most typical way of numbering is this one. So this would be column 0, column 1, column 2, column n minus 1. Let's say for the rows, row 0, row 1, row 2, row n minus 1. So if you take, uh, I don't know, this point here, this point here is so is this is this my RJ? This RJ that I have to multiply zero to n minus one. Clearly, it is not because if I do this rotation and making that rotation with respect to the origin, so the origin is the zero zero point. So this origin, let's make the origin by this origin is here. And I'm rotating this point with respect to this one, not with respect to that. So I want to rotate with respect to the middle, or in general to any arbitrary point. So I want to say, okay, I want to rotate with respect to that point. Let me use the same rotation as it's doing. It's using Okay, so let's call it let's call it R R J C. I want to rotate with respect to that point. Okay, so then what we have to do is to express your coordinate with, as a function of that point. So you take R J, take R J. You subtract RJ naught. And that is the one that you multiply by R theta theta minus one. And that will give me that will give me RI but also centered with respect to an, an arbitrary point. So also centered with some arbitrary point. And now you can rearrange all these things. So this is R i is equal to R i center plus R theta minus one. And then you have R j minus R j but we already know this trick. So this trick of subtracting a reference point and then adding it back, it was something that we already did before. So this is the equation that you have in this slide. So you see. So you have your point. Then you subtract something, you multiply, and then you add. 
something else. So subtracting and adding, so if you take the subtraction, this addition, the other side, let me say subtraction. So subtracting a point is simply moving your coordinate axis, your coordinate origin to somewhere else. Then, uh, yeah, some considerations, and again, th this is too detailed for what we want. So some considerations about what are the, the final sizes in the, of the rotated image. So the rotated image is, is bigger than, than the input one. Um, yeah, depending on, on which uh, direction. So this is the number of probes, this is the number of columns, and then depending on the angle, these number of rows, number of columns, number of columns are, are different. But uh, those, those are very small details for what we want. Okay. And, and this is the, the equivalent figure that I did on the, on the white board before. So once you rotate, your output image will be bigger. This, this will be the end prime and prime that I was mentioning before. Actually, the two are not the same, so you will have an even a different number of rows than uh, columns, depending on the angle. But typically, you keep just the central part, so that is the most common uh, approach. All these details we, we skip. Okay, and in general, in general, the location. The result of this, this is your transformation. This is the function phi that we mentioned at the beginning. This is a function phi that acts on planetary coordinates. So given a, a coordinate in the output, you know all these calculations, and that gives you the, the coordinate that you want to interpolate. And in general, that coordinate that you want to interpolate will be a fraction. And then we know how to interpolate that, uh, and images with a fractional coordinate. We can use this bilinear or the cubic interpolation. So here you have some, some examples. So let's say that we have this image. Uh, we want to rotate it. Okay, so we rotate by I don't know how many degrees. Um, and here we have the result. So this is the rotated one with Neely's label. And then we can compare uh, what is the difference between the interpolating with Neely's label and interpolating with bilinear. And this is the difference. And we see that the differences are mostly at the, at the edges. That makes sense. Because if you are in a very flat area, the, the, if you are in a very flat area, the derivatives that are the ones that the bilinear brings you, they are zero. You are not gaining much. <coughs> and you can compare nearest neighbor to be cubic. And again, the, the differences are like mostly at, at the edges. And this is bilinear, and then we can compare bilinear with be cubic, and this is be cubic. Uh, yeah, nearest neighbor, we already see this pattern. Okay, so let's look at these windows here. See that you have some pattern coming from the aliasing. And now we can be very creative. We can uh, make, uh, we can simulate any kind of geometrical transformation. That is a, this is a, a very typical. Uh, say that. So let's say uh, you want a panoramic, you want a panoramic uh, view. Okay, so you have a, a camera and a bada Let's say this is your camera, okay. and you want to have a, a 360 uh, degrees uh, panoramic. Okay, so one possibility is to stick up the camera. Stick, small stick. You place a middle that is spherical. 
So the camera is recording the video. But then in the mirror, you have all the surroundings. So the mirror is seen on this area. And you're looking at this. You're looking at this. Okay, but you have the information from the whole mirror. Okay, so can we simulate that? Yes, we can. So I want to produce that image. That is the one that could be produced by the mirror. And, and then I, I need to find a way. This is my image J. I need to find the transformation file that takes values in the input or in the output, two values from the input. And, and this is done in this way. Okay, so we will we will have an, an output of size R out C out. Then I calculate this thing. This is something very easy. And you will have an input that is of size R E C and then uh, you have that transformation there. And then for every for every pixel in the output, remember our our path, our path is always we go here. Here. So we take a point in the output and find the point in the so, so for every point in the output, around C out, so this is the J coordinate, I will compute rho. I will also compute theta. And I will define phi as the arc sign of rho divided by rho zero. Okay, so now I have three parameters. Now I go to I need to transform to, to know okay, this point where it is coming from in the input. So where it is coming from in the input, it will be I will compute D, that is D this zero, but this zero is something fixed, times five. But five is something that depends on every point. Okay, so now I will have D, and then I will compute evaluate the input at the location d sine theta, d cosine theta. But theta also depends on every point of the input. You see, so for every point in the output, it's very tedious. So you have to do many, many times the same calculation. But it's very straightforward. It's very easy. And then this will be your output. So now you can simulate whatever. And that means that if you can simulate it, you can invert it. So if you know if you know how to how to take in a flat image, make it make it as a as a spherical mirror, this is the transformation of phi, you can compute phi minus one, so this is the inverse of phi. And you would have to inverse that process, but that means that you could take Images taken by this spherical mirror and make them flat. So this is a very powerful tool, really, really powerful. And this is a little bit of the reasoning why this transformation, but we will not get into this. Really amazing. You can do this. Now you know. Okay. Question. Okay, so let's continue a bit more. So the next lecture is about uh, denoising and denoising of uncorrelated noise. And we will distinguish in two lectures between correlated and uncorrelated noise. Okay, so uh, what is the difference between correlated and uncorrelated noise? So. Correlation, we already know. So correlation means, given a point, you know a bit about the, the signal around. 
So if you give me a point that is noise, I cannot tell you exactly what is in the noise nearby, but I can tell you more or less what, what it should. And in some in some patterns, I can tell you exactly what it will be. So for instance, here we will we already saw this uh, this moiré pattern when we were printing images. Uh, and yeah, so there are patterns that are very, very high correlated, and then we can get rid of those very easily. And the other source of noise is uh, uncorrelated. So the other uncorrelated is that given a point, you don't know at all what will be the noise nearby. And this is the typical noise of in, in CCD cameras or in photography. So it, most detectors, the, the noise is uncorrelated. And the sources of correlation, either it is because of printing or it is also because of uh, some interference. And then at the time of the interference, everything gets corrupted more or less uh, in a similar way. OK, so what is our image formation model? So let's say that my the image that I see is an ideal image plus some noise. And if you make the Fourier transform of that, the Fourier transform of your, in, of your noise image is the Fourier transform of the ideal plus the Fourier transform of the, of the noise. And here are some examples of uncorrelated noise images. So we already know that uncorrelation and the distribution of the points of the, of the pixels, they, they are two different things. So Uncorrelation means given a point, I don't know anything about the other. But that, it is not telling me anything about the distribution of that point. Okay. So the distribution of that point can be Gaussian, it can be uniform, it can be salt and pepper. So this is a Gaussian, this is uniform. And salt and pepper means this most of the times it is zero, but from time to time you have uh, Value 255 or value of zero. Okay. And this is how Gaussian noise looks like uh, in color images. And these are uniform, uh, uh, uniform uncorrelated images. So you see that the appearance is different. Which one is more noisy? What do you say? Has, has more noise. Second, and if you have to describe mathematically what is the feature of the second that is larger than the feature of the first one? No. The variance, the variance of this has to be larger than the variance of that. Okay. And some more example. So uh, this is a this are correlated, uncorrelated uh, Gaussian noise. And and this uh, relationship between histograms and yeah, this is the autocorrelation. So let's let's look at autocorrelation. I think the way we introduce the autocorrelation is more clear. So Okay, so let's say that we have an image I. And then the autocorrelation of the image I at the lag N, that is also a vector, it is the expected value of the expected value of I of R I of R I I of R plus N. For instance, let's say M M is, is called the lag. Okay, so let's say that M is zero one. So that is uh, we are adding zero one to any of the uh, coordinates. So this expected value, it is very nice to, to define 
uh, mathematical properties, but in practice, I only have an image. So, how do I implement this expectation? Okay, so let's say that, and, and here you may remember that in one of the previous classes, we introduced the concept of stationarity. You remember that we mentioned this? Stationarity. You remember? So, the, the, an image, sorry. An image was stationary if its statistical properties didn't change over space. So, this is taking one pixel, one pixel, and the pixel at the end because of this 0, 1. So, I'm, I'm considering this pixel here and this pixel here. Okay, and the difference is is one bit. But this product at this location should be the same as this product in this location. Because the, I assume my image is stationary. And this product must be also the same. And this product anywhere I go should be the same. Okay. So what I can do I have only a single image, so I can approximate the, the stationarity. Because of the stationarity, I can, I can approximate the expectation by a sum. So I will go over all possible arcs where I can construct all these differences. And then compute this product I of R times R of R plus N. And I will average. I will average total uh, number of uh, points that I have been able to construct. Not total number of pairs. Okay. That is what we have in here. So you have to divide by the total number of points you have been able to construct. Or the image at that point plus the files, the image, this file is a, is a yeah. Uh, we will come to this file later. Okay. Uh, but it is I at the original coordinate plus the lag. Okay, what happens? Let's say that I want to use all my points, all my points in the input including these ones here down in the border. My corresponding blue point is, is out of my image. What can I do? I can make it periodic. Whereas uh, this trick we already know very much from the from the Fourier transform. So I can make I of R periodic. And I of R periodic means this blue point is the same as this one. Okay, how can I say that? Okay, so whenever you are calculating, whenever you want to evaluate a R plus rho, so R plus the lag, but instead of taking R plus the lag directly from the image, you will go through this modulus function. This is the modulus is the, the reminder of dividing this x divided by n. So if it is a if it is outside your image, then you always take this reminder. Okay? So this reminder will give you this wrapping. And, and then you get it there. So that is the point that you will evaluate. Any question? No? Okay, so this, this reminder, this modulus, is simply a trick to be able to, to use all the points from my input image. Okay, because otherwise, if my lag if my lag is small, most of them, most of the points I I can use them to estimate the that operation. But if my lag is very large, then uh, these uh, I run out of coordinates very easily because I, 
I am very, very, uh, very soon my my points are outside my age. Okay, but then we use this trick, periodization. You periodize, and because of the uh, the signal is assumed to be stationary, so there is no point, there is no problem in in making it periodic. The, the product, this product, should have the same value as this one and this one and this one. Should be estimates of the same, uh, should be coming from the same distribution. Okay, so there are no other questions. And uh, tomorrow we need an exam. It is minus 132. Um, and that's it.